Hello guys, this is uh, Apple Tree. <laughs> yeah. Hello Irina and uh, hello Krzysztof. So uh, yeah, well, just uh, for those who are uh, listening to us for the first time, this is Apple Tree's podcast for the developers. Uh, and we uh, today has have very special guest, uh, Krzysztof Zablotsky, who is author of Sorcery and other projects and uh, we probably might be talking sorcery and sorcery pro today mostly but uh, before that i believe we should uh, talk a little bit about how you got into the it and like how, how you end up being uh, author author of, of this quite amazing tool okay hey thanks for having me uh how I got into IT, oh my God. I started programming when I was eight years old. I wanted to make games. And I did that for, until like the first year of university, I did game dev ex like exclusively. And I did like 3D graphics, my own UI libraries, all this, like the level of abstraction I had when I started programming was basically, here's how you draw a triangle. And that's the, the highest abstraction. So I had to build everything for, my, for myself. All the algorithms, all, all the logic, all this stuff was not provided back then. And so uh, it was fun. It was very rewarding. It's like, you know, like playing hard game. Uh, it's not like Dark Souls, for example, right? People love Dark Souls because it's so hard to actually kill the boss or get past the specific level. But when you do that, the adrenaline and the endorphin rush you get from it is very rewarding. The same was with the game that for me when I started. It wasn't easy to learn all this stuff, but when I got something to work, it was always like a really good feeling. And so I did games until uh, first year of university, and I mostly did like technical stuff. So like I started with games, but then moved into like game engines, graphics, physics, all this all this stuff uh, because I didn't have I didn't have you know the skills to do actual graphics, like draw stuff and. That really makes it hard mm -hmm. for games. So I focus on the technology instead because that didn't require that. And then in the first year of university, I started working on mobile. So actually, I didn't do iOS first. Like the first, the first mobile project I did was for Samsung Bada, which was like a platform that Samsung uh, was launching, and that was C plus plus and uh, wasn't very successful. But it was how I got started. So a company I wanted to work for uh, basically gave me a call and they said that they got this device. They don't know what it is. They don't have resources to check it out because that was still before official release. So they got the, the phone and like USB with SDK on it. And they asked me if I could take a look at it and uh, like, you know, just play with it over the weekend and see what I can do. And so I canceled my weekend plans and I built a game on that device. And when I came back to the company on Monday with a actual game with physics and everything, and they went to Samsung and they got like a, a contract for a hundred apps based on that work. <laughs> so they hired me obviously. And we, we ended up doing like 15 apps. We didn't want to do a hundred. We didn't have that resource. And I did like, I think 10 or 11 apps for it. Most of them were games, small business apps. And after that, uh, like the, sorry. Like a snake game? Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, a little bit more complicated, but like mm -hmm. I used a lot of physics because that's usually very easy to do, like game. Uh, so the, the gameplay, that's, that's, that's cool. Prepared for this. I, I, I just remember that all uh, iPhone or oh, all um, telephones, all devices, they had like snakes and like these games. So it was more complicated, yeah. Yeah, it was a little more complicated. Like the resolution you had already and graphics capabilities weren't that mm -hmm. that limited. So like that was just before the iPhone was announced and they didn't announce the iPhone. And so I actually wrote my first iPhone application uh, before the SDK came out because before the public SDK came out, there was like a hacker open tool chain thing, which was basically you could run on iPhone like a jailbreak and you had like a Sigwin script which was like uh, on Windows, I basically simulated having a Linux and uh, like Tigwin script to build the application was like a couple screens long. And I built my first game there. And 
again using physics that's you know that's the easiest like physics based games especially when you do like 2d games that's the you know looks cool but it's not very complicated because physics takes care of the gameplay you just have to come up with you know some basic basic rules and so i did first project there and then i did one android project which i never admit publicly because i don't want linkedin recruiters to contact me about that uh, which was also like a physics physics based um screensaver which was really cool really really nice you basically had icons underwater and you had to drag them with enough uh, force to break the water membrane it looked really cool was really really interesting uh, to implement and after that i did my first commercial product which was a press publishing platform which is kind of funny because i've been in press for the last eight years as well and so my first commercial ios project was press related and now i've been you know in the industry again for many many years uh, but that's how i got started on ios after that project i like I, I didn't want to touch other platforms really enjoyed ios especially the fact that it's you know user facing and it has this very high focus on user experience which as a previous game dev game developer i really care about right and uh so from the game dev to uh... Uh, well, to the press, was there something in between? I mean, like you, you, you said that your oh, yeah. first commercial, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the first, well, no, the iPhone came out, I think, two thousand eight or something like that, and so that was where I did the press publishing platform, or like a, a year later maybe. And uh, after that, I did so many different projects. Like I, I did a lot of graphics as well. Like in the beginning of my iOS career, I did a lot of other than like building frameworks and stuff like I've been doing for many, many years, but also focusing on like, I had, I remember an app that I did like 3D navigation. So the whole app was like a R&D app for like a very big energy company. And the idea was that on your iPad, you had like a cube in 3D and you could rotate that cube with gestures and basically shortcut to the different areas of your app. A lot of animations, a lot of graphics. And I also led a development agency in the UK. I lived in UK for two years, and we did a lot of different projects. Um, again, very big brands. Like, I, for example, I did like a Premier League app for The Sun, the UK uh, news publishing. So they bought the rights for the Premier League. So they were the only application that could immediately give you information when the goal was scored. They paid a lot for that rights. It's, very expensive and so i built like i built the whole uh, platform for them after that we we actually it was very successful we built a lot of spin-offs i in general i worked on i, I counted that recently it was like around 50 apps over uh what is it like 14 years so mm -hmm. directly like 50 apps something like that because i do so i do consulting as well and so companies would hire me to to code reviews for their whole application, suggest like pragmatic improvements for their project, how to improve their team efficiency, how to build better tooling, mm -hmm. anything that, you know, so the, the stuff I focus on has very big impact. So like I try to, I don't try to implement like a specific feature screen that, you know, everyone can implement a screen, right? I try to find a way to make your whole team more efficient. So if you hire me, you get rather than, you know, paying my rate and just having like a feature done, I now enable your whole team to build all of the features faster, right? That's what I focus on. That's what I like because those are more challenging uh, but you are still, problems. Uh, still very hands-on, uh, but you are still very hands-on yes. and do a lot of uh, by yourself for, example, for 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 your own personal research, maybe. Yeah, so I I, I am individual contributor still. <laughs> I'm uh, I did like a decade review on my blog recently, and I. Even after uh, two years not working on the main code base, I'm still number one in the amount of commits. Um, I like coding, but like I do a lot of a lot of a lot of hands-on. But I try to do those things around the areas that have like an impact for everything else. So like I build I build automations, not like CI, but more like architectural improvements for the projects. And yeah, that's, that's, that's what companies hire me often to do. Like they want me to look at their projects, see where things could be improved, where their teams 
are facing issues and like how how could the API or architecture be changed to make it more efficient. And that scales so well. I did a lot of math for the clients and like, you know, I can spend like eight hours and save the company like 40 hours per week. And that's just ridiculous return of investment, right? So uh, it's really worth investing into developer experience and architecture and tooling. Very important in my opinion. Right. So, but uh, let, let's talk about one of the, your projects, which is actually like also helping the developers. Uh, so can we go a little bit in the history of sorcery? So how, yeah. how you came up with that? So sorcery is a code generation tool, right? It enables yeah. Swift. Uh, it enables you to do meta programming in Swift. As a type language, Swift doesn't support that kind of feature. But it's extremely useful to be able to define an algorithm on like a global scale. So for every type in this project, I want this kind of feature to exist. And so without sorcery, you have to write it for each type you want to support. And there's a lot of repetitions there. So back when I did sorcery, which was 2016, the first release, Swift was, I think, like 2.0 or something. So even things like equality, hashing, uh, encoding into JSON, all of that had to be done manually. And I mm -hmm. really hate doing stuff that computers can do for me. So I, you know, I wanted, I am like a pain driven developer. I feel the pain when I have to do something multiple times in a row and I just get so annoyed that I, I try to automate it. I'm very lazy like that, right? So mm -hmm. what I do is that's all, that, that's the way I create all my tools. It's like this, like I'm doing something and like I'm thinking to myself, well, this isn't how it's supposed to work. Like this is something a machine could do for me. And the same happened with sorcery. So I had to do, I think, you know, we had to implement equality for everything. We had to implement hashing. Like every single project I worked on or the clients hired me to work on, every single project had the same kind of problems. doesn't matter if it was like a news, if it was a game, if it was like a meditation app, like I worked in Headspace before and a lot of different projects, same kind of problems. And then you have to do the same kind of work for every single client. How many hours are you wasting? How many hours the teams across the world are, are wasting, right? So I queried myself that question and I didn't like the answer. So I, I thought to myself, well, if I can build something that can solve these kind of problems across arbitrary code bases, not only do I save my own time, but I can also save a lot of money for all the companies, right? Especially the clients that hire me. So I originally actually built Sorcery in around 2015, and I had it for like a couple of clients. I used it in a couple of clients' projects, like the first version. And then no one did this. Like I was surprised no one built this kind of tool before. And so in 2016, I decided, okay, I'm going to open source it so that everyone can benefit from it. And yeah, I mean, it was a massive success. Like it's one of the most, most popular iOS uh, open source projects in the world. It's used by over 40,000 applications. And those are not small apps, it's not like just indie apps using it. Like Airbnb uses it, Bumble uses it. Those are like millions of code lines, uh, code bases, which is crazy. And it saves them a lot of money. Right? It saves them a lot of hassle and it makes their developer, you know, enable their developer to focus on what really matters to their feature and their core business rather than fighting with the tool chain and the lacks of the language. So yeah, that's the that's the reasoning behind it. Okay. Uh, do you mind if we will jump to the questions from our audience? Like they might not be exactly related to what we're talking right now, but uh, uh, we yeah, have one no question. Problem. We have a question from the guys who are watching us right now. So um, the question is actually like, what's your attitude towards uh, Kotlin multi-platform, Flutter, and uh, like cross-platform in general? So do you feel that it's something will which will like drive the industry forward or? Uh, so well, let's just say it, just dissect it. So I, I did a project in Flutter. Uh, I built a game for the New York Times crosswords. I, I worked on a game, uh, a new game they, they were working on. And Flutter had an amazing developer experience. One of the best developer experience I have experienced uh, in cross-platform, but even in like in general, very good. 
uh, the architecture was, you know, was designed for the whole workflow, the connection with like I use visual, uh, visual code integration worked flawlessly. I had zero issues with that. It was generally very pleasurable experience to write in Flutter. Even though I didn't know the language, I didn't know Dart, I didn't really know that technology, I was able to very quickly get onto it and build the features that I needed. So I really enjoyed it. I know there are some problems when they moved because they used to do OpenGL for rendering and they moved into uh, Metal as the rendering engine. Metal has issues because Metal doesn't have shader warm up. Basically, whenever you have to display a screen, you have to basically you want to pre cache the shaders because everything is rendered on the GPU. And if you can do that, there is like a significant hit when you open a screen. There's like a delay, which is noticeable. So I hope Flutter fixes that soon. Uh, but in general, very good experience. If they if they solve that, is it's for a lot of apps it makes sense, right? Not a lot of apps have to be, you know, all native, all custom animations. There is a lot of business needs that True. cross platform tooling will work good enough, right? And with regards to Kotlin multi platform, I'm really interested in that. So I I did research on that. I I had actual spikes at the company, and I am looking forward to it evolving. It's still very early phases, so it's hard to tell. I am a big fan of everything that IntelliJ built. Uh, JetBrains, I mean, JetBrains yeah. built. I use all of their IDEs, and I think they're doing an amazing job. And uh, they tried to hire me as evangelist at one point. <laughs> and so uh, big fan of that. And I think Kotlin has a lot of interesting features that Swift doesn't have. Like, for example, Kotlin is able to Based on your code context, it's able to automatically promote types. So if you had a, like an optional and you checked if the optional was not nil and lower down in your code base, it already knows it's not optional anymore. So that's pretty cool, yeah. especially like when you do stuff like ternary operators. Uh, and Kotlin multi-platform is very interesting. I, seeing it involve, like for example, now they suggest a specific architecture pattern in their docs. And that architecture pattern would enable you to share not just the business logic, but also the view models between the platforms. So it's definitely interesting. Um, yeah. I don't think it's ready for production. Like few, I, I checked it a few months ago, and there were a couple of issues with like coroutines and stuff like that on iOS. Um, but it's definitely interesting. I don't think it's going to kill native. I don't think native is going anywhere. But I think for like there are a lot of apps that just the app is not their core business, right? So yeah. the big question when you decide on the technology is, is the product the application? Or is the application just, you know, like a helper for whatever the service we have? And if your product is the application, then native has a lot of benefits that some cross-platform technologies might not have. Although Flutter and Kotlin is not very comparable because Kotlin is native. On, like it compiles down yeah. to metal, whereas Flutter is just rendered on uh, the graphics engine. And that's a very different distinction. So there are different use cases. It's definitely interesting to watch, but I would wait before adopting uh, Kotlin production until it's at least in like, a, you know, it's, I think it's in beta now or alpha status. So they are not supposed to drop it uh, anymore. Like I, I originally looked yeah. at it when it was still unclear whether they're going to support it. It seems like it's, it's going forward and it's going to be the future for them. Um, whereas we can use it when it makes sense for many applications. I think it makes sense for a lot of applications. A simple apps, definitely. I don't see a point in you know replicating the same kind of logic across iOS and Android if, if your app is just consuming JSON, which is a lot sure. of apps, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely interesting to watch. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, to all of our listeners, viewers, uh, feel free to ask questions in, in comments. We will uh, uh, try to answer those. Uh, as of now, let's go back to the source array. So, uh, well, we probably understand the pain points, but are there any like unintended consequences? So maybe you know that sorcery is used for something which you did not expect to it to be used. Some funny moments or I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are a couple of things. So some people are using sorcery to generate like JavaScript and Kotlin. So they use Swift as their source of truth. Basically, the, the way sorcery works, right? Sorcery works, Swift is the input, and what you want is the output. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be yeah. Swift. Usually, it's, you know, most of the time, you generate more Swift. 
you can generate documentation, you can generate statistics, you can generate meta information about your project. Like I use it when clients hire me. The first thing I do is usually I run my layer template that um, queries the project, what like the amount of types it has, what are like the, the most used uh, like inheritance types, stuff like that. So basically it's like a query language, it enables querying your project for um, the architecture. What else is there? Um, so you can use Swift, for example, as the source of truth and then generate JavaScript and Kotlin to build like communication bridges. That's a use case that, for example, we have at the times where we have, um, I build a framework for us to communicate between the, the articles, which are in web, and the native frameworks like ARKit. So the journalist can write articles that script the whole AR experience in the application. So even though the you know all of ARKit and SyncKit is native, it's driven through JavaScript. And I generate all of the all of the bridge through sorcery. So basically the developers uh, of my applications they simply have an addon with the commands that the app supports. And to add a new command, they simply add a new case to an addon with associated values. And all of the code is generated for them. They don't have to write any code. And so that's one of the one of the examples. Before I did Sorcery Pro, uh, I remember a story where Sarush was at conf Sarush Kandu was at a conference. Uh, prolific, like if people don't know Sarush, you should read his blog. He's a prolific contributor to community as well. And uh, he, he told me that someone uh, was using Sorcery in their company, but didn't tell, like they, it wasn't integrated into the project because usually Sorcery mm -hmm. is integrated as a, like a build phase. So they didn't do that. Instead, what they did is they wrote templates for themselves that generate tests and they didn't integrate it into the project, but they just volunteered to get all of the test tickets. And so they would generate the test code and then call it a day. <laughs> uh, you know, very smart programmer. I think <laughs> that deserves a race. Uh, but yeah, those are like a couple of non-standard use cases for people. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned Sorcery Pro. Uh, let's talk a little bit on that. I mean, that's something new, right? It's, uh... mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it's less, less than, than a month uh, that I released it. I think like three weeks ago, I, I released it officially. And it's basically like a standalone application plus an Xcode extension. So there were some people that didn't use Sorcery and their argumentation usually was that they don't want to add a dependency to a project. Although I don't fully agree with that because Sorcery isn't a code dependency. It's just like a tool chain thing. So if you, if like if Sorcery breaks, if I, you know, something happens and Sorcery stops working, you simply disconnect it and you go back to writing this code by yourself, by hand. Right. There is no, like, there is no effect on your code base. And it's not opinionated, right? There is nothing in Sorcery that tells you how the code should look like. It's all your, it's your decision. But some people have that argument. So I built Sorcery Pro as a standalone application and an Xcode extension, which means that even if you don't integrate into your project, you can still benefit from all the automation. So for example, what's really cool about it, because it's it's using just, you know, it's using official uh, API, there's, it's all sandbox and, you know, there's literally zero network calls I do from the application. There's no tracking, no analytics. Everyone can be safe. Like, I don't want, I don't want your data. Like, I don't want to manage data. Uh, there's like a cloud component coming in, but that's using CloudKit again. Like I don't want any of my, like, I don't want to manage anyone's data. And so the way Sorcery Pro works is you simply buy this on App Store or direct, there's like a direct purchase when you can get invoices. You install the application in your system. And then by default, there's like 13 bundle templates that you get out of the box, which are things like generating um, codable for enums with associated values, generating Swift UI, uh, views from structures, uh, generating uh, mocks for your protocols, a bunch of use cases that are very common to IO, like to Swift development, not just iOS development. And you simply, by installing the application, you immediately get in your Xcode, you get editor shortcut. So you have in your Xcode, you can select editor, Sorcery Pro, and then just call the template and it will run on your current file or your selection. So if you put that cursor 
on your protocol, for example, and you run protocol mock, it will generate the mock in that file, um, which is like hundreds of lines of code for like even like 10, 10 lines of protocol. So a massive, mm -hmm. massive amount of code generated automatically for you. And that's basically how it works. There's no dependency in your project. There is no changes in your project. It simply automates uh, you know, your workflow. And there are so many repetitions in our daily life that uh, I would be surprised if in the first week of using Searcher Pro, you wouldn't save many hours, to be honest. And so, it also, like the standalone application, comes in with Edge or that lets you write your own templates. And I built like a well, pretty, pretty amazing editor, to be honest. Uh, so the editor has inline errors, code completion. It has inline documentation. So if you never even heard about Sarsi, writing your own automation, it should be pretty straightforward. It's not really complicated. There is also a workshop I did, which is publicly accessible. You can see how to write templates. But in general, the editor is extremely powerful. It has like a live preview of what the code will look like. And yeah, there is a lot of people using it already. There is like, uh, I think 700 copies people bought and companies are buying in bulk now because I like last week I enabled company purchases. So people are buying like four, 10, even like I have some people buying like 20, 30 licenses for the whole team. And yeah, yeah. I mean, People are like they all like their ratings are all five stars. I don't have a single review that's not a five star. So I think it's working. And uh, do you have a big team to publish it, or you did everything uh, by yourself? No, I did everything myself. Wow, <laughs> with and designs, etc. Amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, by the way, we have another uh, question from our listeners. Is it hard to modify um, Sorcery Sorcery Pro on the fly? User must know uh, how to modify a code generator. In other case, it is impossible to use code generator efficiently uh, from the point of view of the author yeah. of the question. So the way Sorcery, like, so there are two things here, right? The way normal Sorcery integration works is like a build phase. So it's continuous. It's a fully automated. So whenever your code changes, the generated code changes with it, which gives you the confidence that it's consistent. You can never, you can never break. Like th that's one of the one of the selling points of it, right? Basically, if you had a protocol that had eight methods, and you added another method, and you didn't have sorcery, you might have forgotten to add a mock implementation, for example or like proper implementation of that of that boilerplate or what, whatever other boilerplate you had. Like back in the times when you had equality, like you could very easily forgot to check that equality and then you would have very hard to find production bugs because the code would still compile, right? Because if you if you added something and you didn't implement like implement equality for it, the code still compiles, but now you have like cache misses, for example. So Sarsery from the first, I think from the first release had support for language annotations. So many languages like Kotlin or Java have the uh, idea of being able to annotate your types, variables with extra metadata information. Swift doesn't have that, but if you use Sarsery, it does. And the way it works, it's basically like a comment, right? Obviously, I cannot change how Xcode parses it, so I cannot do it fully typed. But it lets you control the the template uh, specific implementation, so you can override specific parts of it, and it's extremely powerful. If you want to see how it's used, a good example of that is a project I did called Automatic Settings, and Automatic Settings basically takes a Swift structure, and from that Swift structure, it creates a editor in Swift UI. So, for example, the Times is using is using this for all of our beta settings. Every single debug setting in our application is now code generated with sorcery. So I removed thousands of lines of code by moving into this, this workflow. And the way it works, if you want to add a new, a new property that the QA or developers can control, you simply add a variable. And that's it. And you build the project. And the UI to mutate that variable is already done for you. And it that's one part of it. And the other part is it's extremely extensible. So if you want to have a custom custom UI for that specific element, or if you want to inject like footer headers, it also supports like substructures. So it's like really nice um, 
really nice um, algorithm. And it uses annotations heavily to be able to do those customization points. So it's a very good example of how to use it. Uh, now, Sorcery Pro works a little different because Sorcery Pro is not fully automated. So Sorcery Pro is additive. It add, adds ability to create workflows that are not possible with automate, like full automation. So like annotations help, but there are still situations where you just want to write, you want to have humans write the code. But you often start with the same uh, generic structure, for example, right? Like if you create like Swift UI snapshots or Swift UI view for like user facing feature, you usually want to represent the data that you have in your model, but then you want to tweak it. You want to, you know, remove some data, do a lot of different things. So this is where Search Pro comes in because Search Pro works as a generator. So it reads your code and generates extra code for you, but you can then take that code and do with it whatever you want. So if you have workflows that are not like 100% possible to automate with uh, the build phase integration, like CLI integration, you simply use the Pro and, you know, just it just saves you the initial amount of work. Yeah. Um, my one question before the, uh, before we move on, like Sorcery Pro is a paid uh, application, so it doesn't have any subscriptions. It's just one time purchase, right? Yeah, it's just right now it's still twenty dollars. I am uh, adding the cloud component, which will mean that everyone in community will be able to share their templates, which I imagine will be a lot of interesting use cases. And uh, like I'll give you. Just showing a few examples, I remember. Like, for example, if you use the composable architecture, there is a lot of boilerplate for every single feature that you write. There is a mm -hmm. template in Sorcery Pro that generates that boilerplate for you to get you started. The same with like GRDB database, there is some boilerplate there that also there's like a, you know, you can template that. Those kind of cases, like property level snapshots. There's a lot of use cases that start with boilerplate, but then you want to still manually tweak it. And that's where like Pro makes a lot of sense. Also, obviously, if you're a sorcery user, like a CLE user, you definitely want to buy the Pro because the editor in Pro is just amazing. And it's just not comparable to what you get with everything else that's doable with Stencil. Stencil isn't very good. But with, with Pro, I basically, I don't actually use Stencil. I wrote my own tokenizer syntax highlighting. I built like the whole thing from the ground up to make it as, as efficient and as, as nice to the developers as possible. So it's definitely a massive improvement. And yeah, it's just 20 bucks right now. Once I add the cloud, which is in less than two weeks, so I have it working already, it's going to go up to $30. It's really cheap for what it does because like how much developers are getting paid, right? Like even if you look at the, the simple use case, which is mocks, right? A single mock, like you have a protocol that has like eight methods, for example. Mocking that consistently, it takes like 100 lines of code, right? Because you have to track the amount of, call, of times it was called, the arguments that was mm -hmm. called in. Oftentimes, you want to mock the value that's returned if it's like using a return. Or you want to record the invocation so you can call the completion blocks. There's a lot of, for every single method, for every single permutation, there is a lot of data. And so with Sorcery Pro, you generate that and it's consistent, right? So if you have 10, 20 mocks, you know, if you multiply it like, like 2,000 lines of code, right? How fast can you write 2,000 lines of code? I think $20 will pay for itself <laughs> quite, quite fast. Uh, as an example, Bumble generates 2,000 mocks. Mm. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the bigger the project, the, the faster it pays for itself. But no subscription. I, I just wanted, like, you know, I wanted to make it paid so I can actually have more time to maintain Sorcery itself, but I didn't want to make it expensive so that more people can use yeah. it. And yeah, well, combining that with the, yeah, with the none of the data ca ca uh, gathering and everything, I mean, like, well, I believe that's uh, 20 and then $30 uh, well spent. I mean, like for, uh, I believe almost any developer, yeah. Yeah, if you if you don't find the value, I will be very surprised. Like I wouldn't have a problem, you know, getting people reference for that. Okay, Irina. Um, okay, so I think it's not uh, the first your, uh, product that you created, um, um, and doesn't it make you upset that 
uh, now any product, especially um, which works with Apple technology, uh, needs like uh, continuous support. Uh, so you just can't uh, create something cool and leave it. Uh, for example, in idea, uh, we um, might not have such um, like impressions of this uh, conversation because uh, Apple changed uh, changed the Swift uh, like very um, uh, very changed it, and uh, for example, now it's not compatible. So that's always a risk. Cool <laughs> and we'll just focus on other things and do also something cool. And uh, you just can't collect it. You need to support. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I this is my sixth indie project on the App Store. The first mock-up, but I did like five kids products, kids applications for the iPad before. Mm. Yeah, it's always, you know, it, I don't see like a better way to do it. I want Apple to be copying those ideas. They copied a lot of my open source <laughs> stuff already. Like, you know, Swift did get uh, equality in hashing, right? You don't think mm -hmm. that like the tens of thousands of people using sorcery to do it and the fact that people at Apple actually used it had an impact? I mean, definitely did, right? Yeah. And so. <laughs> I want, like, the, the reason I open source so much is because I want people to have those things. And ideally, they share lock it. Hopefully, if, you know, at least with this paid tool, I get to earn some money back for all the time I spent. But in general, I want Apple to be doing those things. That's why I share it. That's why I do, like, when I did the playgrounds for Objective C, they were so much better than Swift playgrounds. And, uh, they did also start incorporating some of the features that I had originally, like being able to do interactivity, all this stuff that didn't exist in the first version. And so I want Apple to be doing that. And I want them to be Sherlocking those ideas because the community will be better for it, right? And I will, won't have to maintain it, especially with the open source <laughs> stuff. Like I'm not getting paid for, for doing it. And I, you know, it costs me a lot of sacrifice to be able to share that with people for free. Uh, so hopefully, you know, the, as the language gets better, you know, I, I obviously with paid tools like Sorcery Pro, I have to maintain it, but, you know, I want to maintain it because I think it makes it much better. Like, it, I think it adds a lot of value to Xcode and to workflows. And so as long as it makes sense, the project will live on because I think it will bring a lot of value to the community. And so I don't have a problem with that. And I mean, I'm not going to make a lot of money on it. I don't think so because like the amount of money I get as a contract as a contract developer is very significant. Whereas, you know, I sold like 600 copies. It's not small money, but the amount of time I spend on it, it's not it's not low, right? It, it's a lot of time, and so this isn't about making money. This is more about making a difference. Right, and uh, well. Do you feel it's uh, like uh, like you you have your day well day job or like couple of including like uh, the consulting and uh, the open source I is it exhausting? I mean, in some way, uh, like do, did you ever like thought like probably that might be enough with something of those like or like do you have fun during that and like this fun helps you be motivated to continue? Yeah, uh, <laughs> so it's like I took a break from doing so much open source like three years ago. I had like a breaking point where I decided, OK, I need to actually have some personal time. Because I was working like for 12 years, I worked like 60, 80 hours per week every week. And that's a lot, right? That's a lot. And I always had a full-time job. Like the, the longest break I had from programming in the last 24 years is 10 days. So not a lot. And there were often times where I felt like I'm burning out. Things like sorcery, like the, the, the stuff that I do for open source, I think it excites me because it solves a big problem. Like I was, it was a while since I had so much excitement as I had about doing the pro. So I actually did the pro, like I spoke with Apple and I was speaking with one of the engineering manager at Apple about, about uh, Swift syntax, which is uh, the parser that I used for sorcery. For sorcery. And um, yeah, I was asking them like, are they Sherlocking sorcery anytime soon? <laughs> and he asked me like about the ideas. 
ideas for Xcode improvement. And I had this idea, well, OK, I re just recently rewrote the parser to use uh, Swift syntax because originally I used source code. The problem with source code is <coughs> source code is a demo. It runs in the background. And that doesn't really work with the plugin system because the plugin system is like it's fully sandboxed. So I couldn't mm -hmm. not really communicate with it. And so I, I, that's why I didn't do the pro before. But I like three or four months ago, I rewrote the whole parsing. And it's no longer using source code. It's now fully using Swift syntax, which is self-contained. And so that enabled that plugin. But I, I didn't actually have that idea until I spoke with the Apple engineer. And when I spoke with him, I had this idea, well, I actually, like, I know what I want. So after talking with him, I like I just started working on this project. And so it took me like a month, a month of, I basically worked until morning till sleep. I did the, the job, my main client is the times. So I did times and then I, every other moment I had, I spent on working on pro and, you know, I, I did it in a month, a little, maybe a little over a month. Uh, but that was like burning the midnight oil. That wasn't easy, but I was very excited. Like I, I couldn't, like I would literally wake up at night and I had an idea how to solve something and I just couldn't fall asleep. So I just, I just went and implemented it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy. And there were a lot of times where I felt like I'm burning out. Um, I normally like this, obviously this last year has been really hard for everyone uh, because of COVID. But normally, I have a lot of different passions that help me stay, like clear my head. Like I, you know, I do a lot of training. I do a lot of sports. Like I do wakeboarding. I go to the gym. I do improvisation, which is a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I have all those different things that help me unwind and relax. I still work a lot, but <laughs> this year has been just crazy, right? Because I, everything is closed down in Poland, so I couldn't do any of that except the gym. The gym is the only thing I still could do because. Uh, yeah, there was a workaround for me to go to the gym, uh, but yeah, it's not easy. It's not. It's definitely not easy. It's like I don't recommend people do open source. Like I, when I hire people, I don't care if they have GitHub, even though like you know I'm privileged because I do. But it does also take a privilege to be able to do that stuff, right? Because if I had a family to you know take care of, or someone's sick, or you know not be not have enough money to not like do free work, like I couldn't do it, right? So I think it would be unfair if when I was hiring people, I would expect them to have like side projects or something like that. I don't care about that. Right. Actually, yeah. uh, did you see this? This is a wakeboard. <laughs> I'm a fan of uh, wakeboarding too. Uh, it's, uh, it really helps to clean my mind. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think a lot of sports do. To do uh, wakeboarding in Turkey uh, in April, they uh, open uh, like um, uh, have uh, open borders. I don't know if you are allowed from your country to visit it, but uh, here we can uh, go to Turkey. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to go. I had a good vacation in Turkey, and uh, I think Egypt is also very good for wakeboarding. Mm -hmm. So Egypt, Egypt uh, has good uh, conditions. Uh, uh, they had good conditions, but um, uh, hypnotics, you know, it's a park, uh, wake, wake park hotel in Turkey. They like in um, uh, three of the best uh, wake parks in the world. They are really good. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm just an amateur. Like, I, I'll give you a is uh, they they yeah. now okay. uh, don't allow uh, external visitors to arrive, so it's um, uh, unloaded. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, sp speaking of uh, like uh, being uh, of like stopping the job and like doing something for uh, like fitness and before we started this ep uh, episode and we announced it, we had a couple of questions uh, sent to us privately. So one of the questions was actually like, "How do you keep being fit?" I mean, like this is something not very usual for every developer. Like some developers kind of lacking that in some way. So do you have any recommendations on like what to focus on maybe? Yeah, or I actually have an article I wrote. Uh, so I mean, I've been doing bodybuilding for pretty much as, as long as I did iOS. So like 14 years now or something like that. 
And uh, I have an article when I was getting back in shape after like I had a year off and I was I had like a shoulder injury. And uh, yeah, I can send you a link. It's not sure. safe for work because I'm without shirt, but <laughs> uh, they are there. Like I, I actually summarize the, the stuff that matters in that article. There's like the, the thing, the thing with fitness is, and not just fitness, like in general, right? People focus on things that have very little impact rather than focusing on the, 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 the foundation. The foundation is like the diet. The, it doesn't matter what diet, like, I don't like the idea of the name diets. If a diet has a name, it's a shitty diet, to be honest, <laughs> like the, the healthiest diet you can have, unless you are sick is a balanced diet. There's no, like, you don't resign from eating fats. You don't resign from eating carbs. You don't resign from eating protein. You should never, like, protein is the most important macro in the training. But in general, you want to eat everything, but just in moderation. And, like, the reason I like bodybuilding is because it's not easy, but also because as a programmer, I am, like, a data person, right? And to get fit, you can write algorithms. Like I do, I do have a couple of articles when I was like doing math in like Swift playgrounds and suggesting people how much should they be eating. But in general, the easiest way to know how many calories you need, it's really, it's really trivial for two weeks, yeah. monitor what you eat. So like install my fitness pal or fit tattoo, there are a bunch of different apps. Just don't change your diet at all. Don't change, like, don't try to change your diet. Just note it down for two weeks every day, what you ate. Don't cheat, don't, you know, just be truthful. Wait it, see how much calories it had over the two week period. Do the same with your weight. So weight yourself every day in the morning. And then when you have data from two weeks of eating and uh, the weight change, you can very easily use linear regression. So a very simple math to get the amount of calories you need to maintain your weight. It doesn't matter if you were gaining, if you were losing, just have that data points. From that, like because there are calculators online, but calculators are only estimates. It's really hard to you know be, to know how much activity you have, like in, in terms of those mm -hmm. calculators. So that's the easiest way. Just spend two weeks, be diligent, note everything down, do the math, and then you can go from there. If you want to lose weight, cut like 500 calories daily. If you want to gain weight, add like 200. You usually wanna you want to gain weight much slower than you lose weight because muscle has very strict limits, how much you can build. So if you if, if you eat too much, you will just get fat. Whereas with fat loss, you can go really, really hard. Like I, I often do very hard cuts, but I would not recommend that to normal people because it takes a lot of mental mental power to be oh, yeah. able to starve yourself. And you also have to know what you're doing, otherwise you hurt yourself. But in general, diet is like 70, at least 70% 70 of the success. Like the training, the, tra the idea of training is to enable building muscle or preserving muscle whereas the diet is the fuel without the fuel you cannot drive your car so it doesn't matter if you have porsche or ferrari no fuel you just won't move right yeah thanks <laughs> and before we wrap up we have one more uh question which is probably might be interesting to everybody so uh it's like less than a month or yeah not less but yeah about a month to dub dub, right? Uh, are there any expectations or hopes to see on dub dub from Apple? Like, well, uh, <laughs> apart from just ac acquiring the Sorcery Pro <laughs> or Sorcery, but like. Yeah, I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> although, yeah, my bank account is, is very welcoming. So <laughs> if Apple is listening, uh, I'm always open to discussion. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I have a couple of things I would like to, like I would like, so I already gave them a couple of suggestions when that engineer asked me, uh, but I would like to see a better plugin system. So the first, like the easiest things they can add to the current, which is just the source extension, like give me the module name that the file is in or like the file pad ideally. And uh, what else is there? Give more intents. So right now the only thing you have is the text buffer. It would be nice if you had ability to send an intent from the extension to Xcode. Like an intent might be create a new file. And if I send you an intent, create new file, I can give you the name of the file as a you know, placeholder. 
and the content of the file. If you give me that, then I can like I can automate so many more workflows that now, right now I already do because I'm using like, for example, to do the snapshots test during the snapshot test, I basically copy that into clipboard, but the user still has to press like command uh, mm -hmm. shift N to create new file and then copy it and uh, paste it into that file. But ideally, I could just send an intent and the user would just fill in the, the file name. And I could even suggest that, right? So that's a much nicer workflow. Mm, the other thing is I would like to get plugins for other parts of the project. Like, for example, being able to scan the console for like important information. A couple of use cases that come to mind. I, I, used, to, I used to have a plugin that enabled clickable links. So if you're in your console, you had a link with like a file name and a line of file, you could click on it and will automatically go to the source, which is very convenient because you can basically attach that to every log and then you can see where the log was generated, just jump to it, which is convenient for finding uh, the reasons, like the, the places where the things fail. Mm, the other thing that can come in handy is like you have diffs in your console. Like if you do snapshots test, it, it often gives you like, uh, suggesting to run like Kaleidoscope, for example. So it does KSDIF uh, and the names of the files. You could have that as a plugin and then open the app automatically. Um, the other thing is like, okay, maybe there is like a plugin that lets you um, add some UI to Xcode. Then you, do, you can do the diff inside of the, like use Swift UI, right? They build the widget system, do something like that for Xcode. I wouldn't I wouldn't count on that because that's a lot more complicated. Whereas yeah. the other other ideas I have are very simple to implement. Um, since those features already exist, or they just work like a pipeline, so you just pipe in data into it and then you just do whatever. Um, yeah, th those are like from the tooling perspective. Those are the things I care about. Like what I want to get also is like from package manager. I would like to have ability to run build scripts in the package definitions. So right now the package .swift is sandbox, so you cannot touch any files. So for things like sorcery, so sorcery generates its own code. So sorcery generates more sorcery code, which is very meta. Uh, so I have to do it in a rake because the package is sandbox and I cannot uh, I cannot mutate anything. Uh, so being able to do that, being able to have um, like the ability to do side effects. So like, for example, sorcery cannot be distributed as a package, as in the executable doesn't really work. Yeah. Uh, it can be like the framework is distributed that way. That's how I integrate in Pro, but not the actual you know binding. So it would be nice if we could just get rid of everything else and just have package as the package uh, manager as the only thing that those all the workflows, so Swift Gen, Sorcery, Swift Format, Swift Lint, all those things. Mm. I would like to see Swift UI box, box fixed on Mac because they're <laughs> like so. iOS, iOS, and uh, Catalyst are have bugs, but the native Swift UI Mac is terrible in comparison, much worse. Yeah, yeah. Well, Swift UI is well it really needs some attention in terms of maybe just not the new features but rather like fixing lists stacks everything like and uh, on various platforms uh we have one more question from the audience um mm -hmm. and it's about uh apps which you might uh hear about it's uh did you ever heard about uh, i believe i will be uh naming it correctly zettel Kasten? which is uh, something to do notes and links, uh, like something similar to MindMap, and uh, uh, markup editor, uh, which is called Obsidian. Nope. Mm, no, I don't think I did. Okay, well, that's probably, well, if uh, if the author of the question is, uh, like maybe he will have some better question, but as of now, um, I think that would be it with uh, with our questions and uh, Irina just got disconnected. We have sometimes not too nice uh, internet connections, but uh, well, she still uh, sends us uh, good wishes. And thank you for very much for coming. That was very interesting talk. Uh, I hope that uh, our listeners got something interesting from it and like including how to get fit. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I believe, uh, well, we will get some more uh, uh, purchases of the Sorcery Pro. I mean, that's 
definitely something which uh, helps you uh, save your time and that's honestly like just worth it i mean like just even like calculating something in, into the money like just like no brainer thank you very much uh i hope your uh, sorcery pro will have a huge success and uh well maybe apple will listen to us and uh yeah. well they will contact you privately <laughs> well and uh have a good yeah, day thank you thank you for having me it was yeah. very enjoyable thanks and uh to all the listeners uh listen subscribe share and uh yeah come to us in two weeks for our next episode bye